Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is N. Wes Moss. N. Wes has published a collection of short stories and her award-winning essays and poems have appeared in the New York Times, Saloon.com, and other publications. And today we will speak about her latest book, Flesh and Blood, Reflections on Infertility, Family, and creating a bonding full life. Wes, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. So my first comment, Wes, about your book is congratulations on that graphic artist who created that cover. It's just, if you are walking down a bookstore and you see that that cover, you just cannot help yourself and, and pick it up and see, okay, who is this? What is this about? So that's the first comment that I had to make about your book. It's just amazing. So for the listeners, at the very least, I suggest you will go you should go into the website and see this fantastic art. And then if we speak about the writing later on, that will also blow you away. But the graphic art is just incredible. Can I, can I say, I'm so happy that you mentioned the cover because uh, the art department at Algonquin put that together. And then I discovered that it's from a painting by a living artist named Raul Colon. And he is, I've been in touch with him. I, it's part of a larger painting um, where he was doing a painting uh, of uh, uh, Pandora, the myth Pandora. So it's a full painting of this beautiful woman. And I wanted to buy the painting, but someone already bought it before me. But I, I am, I feel the same way. Very, very lucky indeed to have that most beautiful cover. So can I ask you how does it work? I mean, you write this, you put your flesh and blood right in this book, and then you give it to the publisher and they decide what kind of uh, uh, cover they will put on the book? Well, you know, I've, I've published two books, as you mentioned, and in with the first book, uh, they showed me three, this was with a press called Leapfrog, they showed, the art department showed me three different possible book covers, one that had a photograph and the other two that had a couple of different colors of graphic design. And I weighed in and they were very supportive of my choices. I never really got to that stage with this one because when they showed me the mock-up, I was immediately in love with it. I have a feeling that I could have weighed in and said, oh no, I don't think that conveys what we're trying to convey. But my sense was the art department at Algonquin got it. They got what I was doing with the book and um, boy, oh boy, I had, no, I had no reason to go back and ask them to give me other options because I loved it. Yeah, and you so much portray the content of the book, the infertility part, and the bountiful life as well. <laughs> it's just ironic, but in the same image portray those conflicting ideas. It does. And I mean, this is a little thing, but I love the way uh, they managed to take the portrait, the, the, the painting, and make it look kind of three-dimensional because they they wrapped the leaves and the painting around my name and around the title of the book. So it just feels like the book is growing in a in a field of flowers. It's incredible. It really is. Okay, well, let's go into uh, let's go a little bit into your life. Uh, you have been you you teach writing. Uh, I wonder if this is what you always wanted to be. You wanted to be a writer, or do you stumble upon that by accident? Well, you know, I've always written. Even as a little kid, it's how I dealt with things that were upsetting or confusing. I, I even, I remember back in third grade writing a play. I'm sure it was terrible, but you know, I've always been a writer. However, I never really wrote for the public. Um, I wasn't trying to get published. It was writing for myself. And interestingly, it was really when I realized I was not going to be able to have biological children and yet I still had this desire to create something lasting 
that I decided I would go back and get my MFA and really dedicate myself to the craft of writing. So I got my MFA at 49 years old and uh, I was teaching and I love academia and I still work in academia, but until about seven years ago, I was not writing for the outside world. Okay, and writing for yourself, uh, so many authors have told me that the only way that they can figure out what is it that they are really thinking is by writing it. Otherwise, it's just random thoughts in their head. Uh, but is this something uh, that you will suggest to everyone, even if becoming a writer is not within their ambitions or realms of possibilities? What a great question. Yes, yes, yes. I have done volunteer work. In addition to teaching at the college level, I have worked with senior citizens and I have worked as a volunteer at the Penn Prison Writing Project, working as a, as a mentor with um, a prisoner in the system to help shape their stories. I think that there is something powerful for all of us about uh, being the author of our own stories And even if it's not a profound story, I say to my 18 and 19 year old students, when you write, you are writing to discover what you're trying to say. And so many times I've had students go, I didn't know I even had this thought until I wrote the draft. It's, it's such a thrill to um, use writing to kind of mine our ideas and articulate and shape them. Um, so yes, I, I really believe it is a tool. This is a goofy term, but for self-actualization, for self-validation, uh, particularly if you've had any kind of trauma, even a trauma that some people might think is small, like break, a breakup of a relationship. I think that writing about it is a way through it. It is a kind of catharsis, or it has been for me anyway. It's an additional way of self-discovering. Uh, yes. you, you mentioned that you had this prison writer project, and you are not the first author that tells me about that. I had someone who told me that he goes into prison to teach Dostoyevsky on a regular <laughs> basis. Wow. And I'm that, And the prisoners, they feel, uh, well, first of all, there are a lot of um, similarities between the time of Toyoski to our life. But uh, for you, what is it like to go into a prison and teach people who have been convicted of crimes to teach them how to think and write and put their ideas together on paper? Well, I mean, I, I have friends who teach in the prisons too. And Yes, there are correlations between Dostoevsky and now, but there are there uh, there are correlations between all literature and people who are imprisoned. I think think about uh, revenge and um, Othello, and you know that there are so our literature is very rich for for all humanity. I think it's why art and literature matters. Um, I do not go into the prison, but I work with pen prison writing and have worked with a mentor one-on-one -on -one online. And it is uh, deeply moving. It's life-changing. Uh, and to hear this prisoner's stories and to work with them to try and shape those stories is probably one of the biggest honors I've ever had. Well, through the book, you I discovered that you teach writing at a, a community college. How did that happen? Is was this was your degree on, and then how did you get a job as a writing teacher? Well, yeah, um, I'm at State University now. So, how did that come about? Well, I have a lot of different degrees. So, I have a Bachelor of Arts in English from Sarah Lawrence College in New York State. And then I got a master's in education in secondary English. Um, 
And at that point, I, that was in New York and I was getting married and I got married and moved to New Jersey. And rather than going through the process of getting recertified in New Jersey, I went to the local community college and said, do you need anyone? And it turned out they did. They needed someone just uh, to teach public speaking initially and then college writing um, and then uh, experiences in literature, you know, a, a sort of gateway literature course. And I loved it. And I felt that I had found this is, a, this is something teachers don't talk about that much, but finding the age range of the students mm -hmm. that you are most suited for is sometimes tricky. For me, uh, I fell in love with 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. They, they were and are my people. And while I do work with senior citizens and uh, other people doing volunteer work, these, you know, these, these, this age range is amazing that what they bring to literature and then what they bring to their own writing has been thrilling for me. So once I got my MFA, then I uh, really was able to dive in teaching creative writing as well. Um, and I teach, I write across genres. So I'm able to teach short story writing, but also memoir writing. And I have a middle grade novel that's going to be coming out from um, Little Brown in, in a few years. So I'm able to work with students uh, on a variety of different projects that they're working on. It's a delight. Okay, so last question about writing. Would you recommend, even if, if a person has no desire to become an author, to at one moment in their life take a non-credit writing class? Oh, yes, absolutely, 100%, yes. And in fact, I think, I think we should all do all art. I think we should all feel invited into painting and dancing and singing and writing, all forms of self-expression. To me, art is, if anything's gonna save this world, Alain, it's going to be art and it's going to be all of us um, expanding our sense of what it means to be human, to have more expansive sense of humanity. And I believe that comes from making and digesting art. So yes, yes, yes. Listen, I taught at a place in New York City called Gotham, where it's a non-credit bearing school that teaches just writing. And I had people in those classes, like I had a patent lawyer taking a fiction writing class. These people were changed by those classes and they were not trying to get a degree and they may not even have gone on to publish anything. They were writing because they, they had uh, a love of books. They loved to read, they loved stories and they wanted to participate in the process. I think that is what makes us human and um, Wanting to be perfect or thinking about writing the great American novel and then deciding to write, that ruins everything. Mm -hmm. I think we need to go into it with a feeling of playfulness and um, a willingness to fail and experiment. Um, so sometimes those sort of new writers, people who aren't professional or don't even particularly plan to become professional, some of those people have the freshest ideas and the most joy of anyone because they're not trying to prove anything. They're just enjoying making art. And that's that's also a delight to be around. Well, okay. So here's, when I ask this question right now, I'm thinking of a person like myself, I'm 54 years old and I'm, let's say in the second stage of my life, if we could say that, but for a young person, I feel like they are pressure into taking programming classes, engineering classes, accounting classes, uh, among them, among the many reasons is because it's education is so expensive. And if you're going to spend, I don't know, X amount of dollars for an education, you might as well invest that money on something that is going to have a high return on investment. So the idea of taking an art 
class, it seems like either ridiculous or a huge luxury that only people with huge amount of money can do. I, first of all, I'm older than you, Ella. I'm 57. If that makes you feel better, you're young compared to me. Um, and I do know what you're saying. You know, I, I am working right now um, at a state university called William Patterson University in Northern New Jersey. And we have a lot of first generation college students and they need to get an education um, and are planning on getting an education to help their families, right? They're not kidding around. They have to work. But I also think that um, capitalism is sometimes gets in the way of becoming a good human being. I can give you a great example of this. I, one of my degrees, I got a certificate from Columbia University recently in something called narrative medicine. And what is narrative medicine? It's teaching doctors to speak more effectively and to interact more effectively with their patients and with their coworkers. What is the practical real world effect of that? They get sued less often. They are, right, there's less litigation um, against a doctor who spends time digesting art because they have a more ethical and humane outlook and presentation. Um, they di their diagnoses tend to be measurably more effective. So to say that art is a luxury, I would disagree with that vehemently. I think art is essential. So right, being a doctor requires hard science and I want doctors to be good at hard science. I want them to be good at organic chemistry and math and all of that. But I also want them to be ethical human beings who talk to me in a way that uh, helps me be well. And to do that, to be reminded of my humanity, it turns out uh, there are, there's a whole field of medicine now called medical humanities for that very reason. It turns out better doctors um, and better results for patients. So I, I would say it is not a luxury and that there are these forces that be that say the humanities are a luxury. And I, I deeply disagree with that. Well, I did, have, I did have an interview with a doctor who is a director of a hospital and he wrote a book about the return on investment on kindness. Oh. And he made a point that an extra, I forgot the amount of time that he calculated, but let's say a, a minute, an extra minute, yes, caring and showing some humanity towards your patient. Uh, first of all, the patients became healthier uh, a lot sooner. And secondly, the point that you bring across that they get sued less, it also reflected in the bottom line of the hospital. So they have less legal expenses and the patients were happier and the doctors and nurses were also happier and more productive. Imagine that. Absolutely right. I, I love whoever that doctor is. I love him or her. And I agree with them, right? Um, the it's not even spending an extra minute with a patient. It's spending, let's say, the same five minutes you would spend with the patient, but spending it in a way where you are really, really listening to them um, in the same way that we might interact with a work of art. We don't look at a painting and say, I know exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. We look at a painting and we, uh, we stand in awe of it. We ask questions questions about it. We say, I wonder what the artist intended making this color and that light um, go together in this painting or what that expression on that face is supposed to convey. If we could take five minutes with patients and do that same kind of thing, look at them, not with, let me tell you what's wrong with you, but instead an expansiveness where we um, to use a line from George Saunders, where we interact with one another by trying to intuit one another's expansiveness. Imagine how much better medicine would be. Imagine how much better all of our relationships would be, right? We, we should be interacting with people um, in crisis as they tend to be around doctors with the largest, openest heart possible.
Okay, let me ask you now about the book. Uh, right at the beginning of the book, you were telling us about how Grandma Hastin lived with you the last year of her life. And I see this as an additional luxury that that other people don't have anymore to spend the last year of life among their family, friends, or people who love them. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about Grandma Hastings? And then secondly, about this social problem that we have, that we have other people dying alone. In, oh. Yeah, just, just waiting for their death, patiently looking at the clock and just dying. Well, Grandma Hastings, is everything to me. Grandma Hastings, she died when I was six years old and I'm 57 now. And without even trying, I have thought of her every single day of my life. She and I made a big impression on one another. And there she was in her eighties, moving into her daughter's house, a, a house full of four kids and a lot of you know chaos and happiness and animals and all that. But I needed attention and she needed to be needed. Mm. And boy, oh boy, did we click. We were best friends for that year and it changed my life. Um, my middle name is West and I go by it. That was my grandmother's birth name, Rosina West. And so every time someone calls me West, I think of her and I wear her wedding ring on my finger. My mom gave it to me when I got married. And, um, you know, the, the things that we, uh, I think it was, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who said, one of the best things we could do in America is put nursing homes next to kindergartens, <laughs> right? What if, what if we could put older people in America, instead of separated and walled off, let them be where they are needed. Children want to be listened to and their parents are too busy feeding them and clothing them and putting a roof over their heads. Um, but grandparents are not too busy. And in fact, the, the very end of my book, I end up in Holland. And one of the things I was so struck by in Holland is that they do have homes where all the generations live together. I mean, I just witnessed so many grandparents riding their bikes over to the school to pick the, the, their grandchildren up from school at the end of the day. And I, I really was jealous of that. I feel like um, we are also walled off from each other in so many different ways. And to be walled off from the people with the most wisdom um, and also the people who can show us that it's okay to grow old. I think we, we are much the poorer for that. And my mother is now 88 and I'm very happy that I get to be in her life all the time. She's my mentor for growing up and growing old. Like, I hope I can grow old the way she has. Um, and, and wouldn't we all be lucky to have more of that? And do you think this is mostly a problem of mostly industrialized countries because uh, I'm come from South America and there there are many multi-generational uh, households. So grandkids and grandmother, they share their life. Uh, they, it is rare in the families where that doesn't happen. Yeah, you know, I don't know if it's industrialized or... I don't know. I know that our culture in America tends to um, find aging and illness to be quite taboo, which is too bad. Um, Holland is a pretty uh, fantastic country, right? They're modern, and yet they have they still respect the old people in their communities and keep them in the family home. So I'm not sure what the difference is there. I think our culture, I mean, I'm just guessing at this, but my sense is, is that our culture really values independence mm -hmm. and, um, and living alone. And that's all very well and good, except look who it excludes if you don't have children um, and if you're old, you get shipped off somewhere, uh, which is not always the most loving way to treat someone. In fact, 
there's a moment in my book when um, my father, who who is dead now, but years ago on his deathbed, uh, I asked him if he had any regrets. And his regret was that he didn't help Grandma Hastings come home from the hospital to die at home. She really, really wanted to come back and die at home. And back in that day, people didn't disagree with doctors. And the doctor said she has to be here in the hospital. Wow. And my dad regretted that for a good 30 years. Um, he held on to that and on his own deathbed, that was one of his regrets. So taking care of the people we love um, is very important for our own souls, I think, for our own peace. Um, because it, otherwise, I do not want to be like my dad on my deathbed, regretting that I didn't um, take better care of my mother, you know. The beginning of the book, you made a dedication that I thought it was odd. Uh, you says for my mother, and you said for my mother and my and her mother and her mother and her mother. Is it like that? So I mean, I can I can understand you dedicating the book to your mother and her mother, which is your grandmother, but then you are two other generations here. I wonder why you did that. Yeah. Well, I do talk a little bit in the book about my great, great grandmother. Um, so she would be the final, her mother. Yeah. Uh, that's great, great grandmother Bryce. And, you know, this book is in one way about my inability to be a mother. Mm but it's also a book about mothers. I mean, it's, it's, it's maybe contradictory, but um, I feel uh, part of my sadness about not having children of my own is that my great, great grandmother tried very, very hard to have children. She lived through the civil war. Two of her children died very young. A third one died after giving birth to my grandmother. Um, so, by the time she died, none of her children were alive. And um, she ended up raising her granddaughter. Then my grandmother, Grandma Hastings, also had trouble. Um, she had a, a, a baby who only lived for a week. And then she uh, was able, finally in her 40s, to have my mother. So I, I guess I wanted this to be my idea of keeping their legacy alive. I was not able to keep their legacy alive in children of my own, but I felt like maybe this book was me uh, keeping their story uh, alive as a kind of legacy. This book holds their stories and um, sort of casts their line into the future a little bit too. Uh, since I wasn't able to do it with children, I tried to do it with art. Well, <laughs> sometimes, yeah, and art can live forever. Um, right. You also talk about, uh, for, let's talk about relationships. You said that uh, before you met Craig, you had bad relationships. And in fact, when you were with uh, Craig, you feared that he would either cheat on you or he would leave. So I wonder if you, I mean, <laughs> pardon my indiscretion, but if you could talk about uh, the- uh, the. Uh, I feel like you and I need to go have a martini together. <laughs> you know, um, yes, I, I think that the world can be a very cruel place, right? And um, I am a late bloomer in every way. I, I found the, my right partner, late in life. I started writing late in life. I'm, it's not bad being a late bloomer when it's late because now I'm blooming, but, but it was, you're right. These are hard years when you're not, you have not yet found your place in the world. Um, I remember when I was first dating Craig, my father was still alive and I complained to my father. I said, you know, he texts me every day telling me where he is and what he's doing. And I said it in a kind of a snippy way. And my father said, West, it sounds like he loves you. <laughs> and I went, oh, right. I, I think um, what we find sexy in our 20s and 30s 
is not always uh, what's good for us. I may be found on, I didn't know until I was late in my thirties that kindness could be sexy and that, you know, a good sense of humor and uh, loyalty, that those things, I didn't understand how much those mattered until I was older. So I'm glad I didn't marry any of those other people. Um, I married the right guy. It just, I had to wait a while to find him and to recognize his charms, you know? Well, I mean, that's the best kind of ending. It almost feels like the endings of those movies of, uh, and they live ever, uh, happily ever after. Yeah. And you describe the mundane scenes of life or how he was taking care of you when you were going through all the difficult situations in your life and he was always present. So that sounds like who else, who who better would you like to have in your life than someone who is always there when you actually need them? Well, you know, I love that. I love that you ask about that too, because while the book on one hand is about something sad, right? Uh, you know, an illness and infertility. It's in my mind, secretly, just between you and me, um, it's a love story, really. Mm -hmm. It's a story of, um, it's hard to write about a happy marriage because there's not a lot of drama. So to try and find the little gestures that convey um, what it's like to be loved by a good person, that was a challenge that I enjoyed. And um, and also had to be cared for by my mom, who was 82 or 83 or 84 at the time. Um, that was also a challenge. Like, I really wanted to convey to readers what it felt like to have people take care of you in a simple way, right? I, it's not like we had a lot of money. We did not. Um, but we had creativity and sweetness. And those carried the day. And the natural world as well um, was a big healing element. Okay, uh, now uh, let's, I feel like I'm skirting around the main topic of the book, which is the infertility and, and the bleeding that you had and all this and that. But there are so many topics that you cover that are also, I find extremely important. So for example, how come our culture doesn't talk about women's issues? How come, I mean, we all know about uh, periods and fertility or interfertility. To be honest, this is the first time I ever read the word his, hysterot <laughs> I, I cannot even pronounce it, hysterotomy, which is, is, is a testament to my ignorance, but also to the fact that we don't talk about issues that women have to face in their life. Well, yeah, you are not ignorant. Um, we are uh, taught as women and maybe as men, um, but definitely I can speak as a woman to be ashamed of our bodies and to also feel that we are defined by our ability to be mothers. Um, it turned out when I did some research that a huge number of women have hysterectomies in America every year. 600,000 American women have hysterectomies every year. And I learned that because when I finally started telling people that I was having a hysterectomy, it turns out everyone I know, it seemed, had had a hysterectomy or their mother had or their wife had and had never had a chance to talk about it um, it's hard enough to go through things like infertility and a hysterectomy. You know, that's already a little bit difficult um, or a lot difficult, depending on the person. But to have to feel ashamed about it and to have to be alone in it, I think is unnecessary. Um, so I'm doing my little part. First of all, you now know how to say the word hysterectomy. So I feel like I've changed the world a little bit. Um, but I think I'm, you know, just in telling my story, it felt like a little bit of a brave thing to do. And like, maybe I was making it a little bit easier for other people to talk about it. I, I did hear from a reader recently, and I love hearing from readers, by the way, if anyone ever wants to find me on social media, I, I'm at N West Moss and reach out. Um, but I heard from a reader who said she had gone through several miscarriages 
and she was reading my book and she read one of the chapters. The chapters are very short, like a page or two. Um, and she brought the chapter, she marched into the other room and read the chapter to her husband. And then they sat down and talked for about two hours, like they've never spoken before about the miscarriages. That was very touching to me. I mean, it gets, I have a little tear in my eye just thinking about it. Um, because that's exactly what I'm hoping is that this gives people the language to connect with other people in the world. That's what art's supposed to do, I think, right? Make us a part of the human experience and that she could now talk to her husband about her experience because I sort of, I gave her some words and then she was able to find her own words. How lovely, uh, that, I, that's all I could ever wish for. It's such, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. So yeah, and you know, people are sometimes awkward and say the wrong thing too, because it's all embarrassing mm -hmm. and uncomfortable. But I say, let's forgive all those people. They are suffering from the same lack of words as the rest of us. And uh, they don't know how to bring it up without sounding awkward and goofy, and they're trying. Um, and so I say, let's just all talk about it because it, half the population is going through something like this. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've experienced this, but it seems to me that anything that is taboo in a culture is potentially dangerous, right? Um, I think when we can't talk openly about sexuality or about our bodies, we see all kinds of, um, of you know, racism comes out of taboos. Sexism comes from taboos. This misunderstanding of the other. Here we are, um, you know, half the population, and I think we don't have to seem scary or mystical. Let me just tell you what it's like being a woman and um, maybe uh, it can lead to more equality in various ways. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned this a couple of times. We lack the language to talk about women's issues. I don't even know how to, well, right now I'm divorced, but when I was married, I didn't even know how to talk with my ex-wife about her period and the cramps and pains that uh, I just knew that that was the time that I would leave her alone because that's what she would ask of me, leave me alone. But I, I, I didn't know exactly. And, and I guess our lack of communication created that okay she said leave me alone I'm not going to even ask questions and and I guess shame or I don't know what is it she wouldn't go into detail to explain to me what was happening to her or her body at that time right well again poor both of you right like you didn't know you don't you didn't want to push she was telling you what she wanted um and she also may have felt uh like she didn't know how to explain it to you. I, I wrote a piece back in 2008, a short piece that ended up in the New York Times about one of our several miscarriages. And I heard from a lot of readers. It was exciting. Um, more than half of the people who wrote in were men, which really surprised me. And in general, what they were saying was, someone I love has had a miscarriage and I want to know about it, but I don't want to further hurt this woman who I love. And so I see every time I bring it up, they are, they find it painful. And so I'm very grateful that you wrote about it because it's given me a little tiny bit of a sense of what this woman I love is going through. And so you know, I very purposefully asked some male authors to write blurbs for the book, you know, those little sentences that go on the back of the book, because I want men to feel invited into this conversation. My miscarriage was also Craig's miscarriage, right? My infertility was also his infertility. Our, it is our childlessness. And I imagine that if I'm finding it hard to talk about, it might be even harder for him. 
because he also has to navigate not hurting me and not embarrassing me. And yet he's grieving too. I'll tell you, he's still, I haven't mentioned this in any other uh, interview, but he still has the sonogram from one of our pregnancies on his desk in a little picture frame. Wow. I mean, it, that also makes me very emotional, uh, you know, because that was a that was a, a second trimester pregnancy. There was a heartbeat and everything, and he was very excited and invested. It whether or not he's able to express it, it mattered to him quite deeply and continues to matter to him. Um, and so I'm hopeful that men do not feel walled off with this book. I would love to see men read it with their loved ones, uh, you know, alongside them and maybe get, get to see, oh, this is, oh, how interesting, right? right. Um, it, it's not so secret or taboo anymore. You also mentioned that this, the book that you just wrote is the one that you wish you would have read when you were going through all these difficulties. And I wonder how come among the millions of books that are published every year, they have until now, they haven't been one that talks about these issues and, and that a person who is going through all these difficulties can uh, sit down and read and feel like they are not alone in the world. I'd like to know that too, Ella. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. I think I'm living in a very good time right now. There are books out just this year where people are beginning to discuss it and it's more in the news than it's ever been. But, um, you know, I think that uh, until about 1900, the early 1900s, most books were written by men. Mm -hmm. Um, even the books that were about women, there's a great passage in Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, where she goes to the British Museum, and she realizes she's in their library, and she looks around, and every single book is about women, right? Even the Odyssey is about Helen of Troy, and uh, every book is about women, but she could find only three books that were written by women about women. So I think it's pretty recent that we have felt we could find our voices. It's not that long ago, right, that women even got to start voting, much less feeling brave enough to tell their stories, much less than telling stories that we've been ashamed to even talk to other women about. So we live in a good moment, I think, um, where we can share our stories more than ever. And I hope that's happening. I really did. I, I don't know about you, but I find art is what sees me through difficult times. And usually it's books. And so I was looking and uh, there were a couple of books that were extremely emotional. There were these tabloid type books that were you know my hysterectomy gone wrong I don't want to read that when I'm facing surgery that's not what I was looking for what I wanted more than anything was to feel like a friend of mine had gone through this and was going to sit down with me over a glass of wine and tell me how it had felt for her that's what I wanted and so that's really what I tried to approximate with this book. I tried to make it uh, friendly and non-intimidating. The chapters are short. The, um, there's humor in there, just as there is when I'm talking to a friend, even about sad stuff, there's often humor there too. Um, and there are no bad guys in this. The doctors are not bad. The men are not bad. The women are, we're all doing our best Sometimes uh, we, we blow it, you know, um, everyone makes mistakes, but there are no bad guys. Everyone's invited in, in this book, no villains. Right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start wrapping this up. Uh, so your book, you are, as you describe yourself, you are a late bloomer, you marriage uh, in your forties, then you were not planning to have a kid, but you, you got pregnant and then you have a miscarriage then another one and then another one. So these are like the, the 
tough period of your life. But then all this uh, reflection uh, also created uh, a bountiful life for you. So can you describe in which aspect all this experience made a bountiful life for you? Well, I it sounds um, it sounds confusing maybe, but I feel like an extremely lucky and happy person. Um, now, it's true there are things I didn't get in my life, but isn't that true of everyone? Don't we all have dreams that fail to materialize? I think that's part of the human condition. I said to a friend, if all our dreams came true, we'd all be astronauts, <laughs> you know? But we all come to a crossroads where a dream of ours fails to come true. And I think what makes us who we are is what we do with that. So for me, yes, it's true. I was unable to have children, but I find it moving that I took something sad and I tried to make something beautiful out of it. Um, so I feel very loved. I Being a writer uh, and fully committing to that came out of not having children. That decision to commit to writing was because I couldn't have children. And I feel like um, my writing gives me great joy and connects me with people like you and with listeners and with readers. I have new friends because of it. Um, so I think, you know, I hope my great, great grandmother Bryce would be proud of me and say, good girl, right? Good girl taking what the hand that was dealt you and um, making something, uh, oh, trying to make something beautiful out of it. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, Wes, uh, the last question, of course, is can you tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners follow the work that you do? Yes, so it's called Flesh and Blood, Reflections on Infertility, Family, and Creating a Bountiful Life. Um, it's published by Algonquin. You can get it anywhere. You can get it anywhere. But of course, I, I also would like you to support your local bookstores if you can. Um, and you can reach me on social media. I love hearing from readers and I'm, I'm meeting with a book club tonight on Zoom. So any book club should reach out to me um, on Instagram and on Facebook. I'm N West Moss, which is just my author name. And then on Twitter, I'm at Scout and Huck. That's Scout and Huck, those two great characters uh, from uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and Huckleberry Finn. So. Uh, I hope you'll find me and I hope you'll all go write, go write something. All those links will be in the show notes. Uh, Wes, thank you so much for your time. Oh, Alan, thank you so much.